This is one of the passages that keeps me going. I hope it does the same for you. Today's teaching passage is uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of God. God bless. Amen. Thanks, man. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll take that Bible. Thanks. All right, you can be seated. <laughs> it's my nice brown leather bond. Uh, ESV Bible that I'm so happy with, so I need it back. Thanks. Hey, um, <laughs> hey, uh, I want to open with a question today. Is, um, are you happy with who you are today? Like, are, are you happy with who you are? It's not a trick question. Just honestly want to know. You don't have to answer out loud if you, no, I'm not. Or, yes, I'm not. Yeah. So, so are, are, you, are you happy with, with who you are, how things are going, with, with just... You see, I, I, I think most of us would say, yeah, but also no. Some things that I'd like to see change could be in your character, could be in your physical health, could be in, just in, in, in your work, in your parenting, in your whatever. Um, but there's probably something that you may be thinking of, like, ah, oh, I'd like to see something change in my life. Maybe as you're sitting here in church and you're thinking, I'd, I'd love a deeper relationship with God. I, I'd love to grow more, to be more Christ-like. I think we're all seeking some change to some degree in, in our lives. That, that we understand that we're on a, on a path, on a journey to I don't know, become better people, right? Big question is, what will take us from here to there? What, what will take us from the person that you are today to the, to the person that you want to be? And there's, I think, a bunch of answers that we're quite familiar with. Just going through them, there's, there's willpower, of course. Willpower will get us there. Like, <laughs> if you just really want to and, and just really make an effort, then you, you'll get there. I think we're quite familiar with that one. Uh, information this is, is often an answer. You know, if you want to see improvement in the world, then we just need to educate people. We just need, you know, if, if we get people to write books and to write podcasts and to write documentaries and write teaching and everything, then, you know, it, it just, we just need to get it all into our heads and then that, that change will come, right? That's, yeah, definitely. Just the right information. Maybe the right inspiration, inspiring people, you know, examples for your life, or in inspiring talks, or maybe experiences that, that, that will get you there, that will, that, will, that will help, that will move things along. Or maybe support. You know, if you get the right people around you to support you in, in seeking that change, I want to become a better parent, so I'm going to talk to other parents, and we're going to together become better parents. See, these are all really great answers. These are all absolutely essential one of the problems, though, is that as a church, I think we're, we're doing a lot of that, right? We're doing, you know, I hope Sundays are inspiring for you and, that, that, and informative. They help you along and that we provide a church community of support to, to help us all to like, grow to be more Christ-like. And, you know, churches have a track record of stressing the importance of willpower. So <laughs> I guess <laughs> some of that will be in here as well. So, so why... Why do we see this lack in change? And some of it is happening. I think, I think we're doing well, but why, why is that, that not complete? Why, why, don't we, why, why are we not yet the people that we want to be? Why, something seems to be lacking in this whole picture. So even though all those four important things we do, why, why do we not see the change that we'd like to see? In today's passage... And we're at the opening verses of, of a longer passage that we're working through today. Today's passage, Paul is giving us what I think may be a missing piece in this whole picture. And that is purpose. Purpose. In this passage, Paul is giving us some instructions on, on, on the what of, of uh, growing to be more Christ-like. He's giving some beautiful instructions on, on the how. But really... What I think is the core of this whole passage is that he's giving us a why, a why. 
If you're familiar with the work of modern day leadership guru, uh, Simon Sinek, uh, this will sound familiar to you. So his well-known book is uh, Start With Why. And, uh, this is, I, I must honestly, I haven't even read it, but it, I, it feels like I'm familiar because I've heard about it so often. Uh, so he, what he does is he stresses the importance of starting with the why, especially for companies, but I think this, this applies much broader. And he says, you know, companies that, that are really successful don't just have a great what, like what are we doing and how are we doing it, processes and everything, but they start with the why. They've got leadership that thinks, why are we getting out of bed? Why do we even do this? Why do we even bother? What's the, what's the purpose? What, the, what is the motivation that drives us? And they start with the why and then think about the how and the what. And what we often do is that when we seek a change, we direct that willpower and that support and that inspiration to the what. Like, how can we, like, what do I need to do differently to be a better person? But Paul in this passage is, is really like, 2,000 years ahead of Simon, saying, <laughs> you know, is, 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 start with the why. Start with the why. What is it that motivates you to become more Christ-like uh, and not, like, what do I need to do differently to be more Christ-like? What's the why? True change begins on the inside, begins with that why, and then that drives us towards, okay, how, and okay, what. But that keeps us going to grow, to be more Christ-like. So I'm going to talk through this passage, starting with the why, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the how, and the what is kind of self-evident in the, in the passage. All right, starting with the why. Paul will be talking about two important things that have to do with this, and actually the beauty of this, the message of this, is that he combines them together. He talks about our identity in Christ, you're hidden with Christ in God, and then our future. And then he combines them together. Take a look at verse 3 and 4. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So first he says you have a new identity. Like, and we've talked through this in this whole message series. Like you're qualified and you're, you're in Christ. And you know, Christ is everything. So we've talked about this a, a great deal already. But it's so important. It comes back basically every message. Uh, so you know, we, we are now in Christ. We are new people. You know, he, he, our whole self, body, soul, and spirit is, is, is hidden with Christ in God. We're safe. We have a new secure position in Him. Something has changed on the inside. We are now a new person. But then what He does is He, he connects that to our future expectation more theological terms, he puts that, that new identity in Christ in an eschatological context, or our expectation of what will happen in the future. He, he puts it in that perspective. He says, when Christ appears, and that he's talking about the return of Jesus Christ. That's what, that, this is what our world is heading towards, where, where God is moving history towards is the return of Jesus. That, that's the, 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 the climax of world history and the start of a whole new era, so to say, in, in life on, on planet Earth. This is where God is moving history, when Christ appears again to make all things new. That day is coming, and we need to see that new identity in that perspective, because when Christ appears, when that happens, you will appear with Him in glory. That's what's going to happen. You belong to that new reality, that new reality, that new kingdom is already beginning to break through in our world. This is kingdom theology one-on-one. -on -one. If you've been here for a little bit of time, then you may be familiar with uh, what, we, what we mean with that. So the expectation of your future, of what will happen in the future, is an essential context for why we need to become more Christ-like. So from that identity, we're moving towards that future. It's this future of unity with Christ that we are now preparing ourselves for. That future, the destiny, that's the purpose. That is the why for our process to grow, to be more Christ-like. And so he continues here in verse 5. Put to death, therefore. Therefores are always important, especially in Paul's letters. Therefore, why therefore? 
because Christ will appear in glory and you will appear in glory with him. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, kind of the same thing, right? Covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, again, eschatological perspective, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, also kind of the same thing. Uh, obscene talk from your mouth. Paul talks about two different types of sin, uh, sexual immorality, kind of puts them together in different words, and then um, sinful speech, like anger and malice and slander and all of these things. Two different types of sins that we're all too familiar with in our world today, sexual immorality and just people being angry at each other and ugly with each other all the time. We're, we're reaping the bitter fruits of that every day. But what I want you to see here is, is Paul is not saying, don't do them because they're bad, right? They are. They're bad. They're, they're not good things to do. But it's not like, stop doing them because these are bad things. He says, no. He says, you belong to a different reality. You belong to the reality of the coming kingdom of God. You belong to Christ. And when he appears, you will appear with him in glory. You belong to a different reality. You're citizens of heaven. So put to death whatever belongs to the earth, what, what, what's going to waste away, because on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. But you're not under the wrath of God. You're under the grace of God. You're under the restoration of God. So therefore, like this is the why, but to, like, get rid of all those things that are just, they, they just don't fit you. This is not what God has for you. He has a new future for you. You belong to that new reality. See, before the Lord comes to say, behold, I'm making all things new, there's a whole lot of wrath that's coming down on everything that's corrupt in God's beautiful planet. Before that restoration, before that recreation, there is a decreation. We've talked through this uh, in our Revelation series a year and a half ago. And so Paul says, put to death any immorality where the ex it expresses itself in sexual immorality or, I guess, verbal immorality. Because it all belongs to that part of the world that God's wrath is coming over. But you belong, you belong to a different reality. You belong to a different future. You belong to that part of the world that he's coming to restore and redeem. Yes, even to marry. So you have a new identity. You have a new future. And these things become your motivation. These things become your purpose, your why for growing in Christ's likeness. Okay, we're going to take this a little step further. All of this kind of comes together in this one beautiful picture in the book of Revelation in chapter 19. When Jesus comes back, right on the white horse, there's a whole lot of the sort of the final sort of wrath of God coming down on everything that's in rebellion to him and is wicked. And then, <laughs> so we're not going to go through that right now. Uh, but, and then <laughs> he comes as the bridegroom showing up for a wedding. I read this the other day in, in, uh, for communion. I'm going to read it again today. It's so beautiful. When I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The Lamb is Jesus Christ. And his bride, what has he done? His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Can you picture it? For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the same. That Christ likeness. That's the that's a dress. And the dress that she's wearing at the wedding. So let me ask you, what does the bride need to do to get herself ready for the wedding? She has to say yes to the dress. She has to say yes to the dress. <laughs> Fine linen, bright and pure. These are the righteous deeds of the saints. You know, I, I, I am not a TLC watcher, but I'm vaguely familiar <laughs> that this is a program on television. So. Okay. 
Here's how Paul will talk about growing in Christ-likeness in this very passage. Verse 12. Put on then, put on like a pair of new clothes, put on like a, I don't know how you put on a wedding dress, but I guess it's really difficult. But it, <laughs> put, put on then, put on as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, this is the, this is the what of Christ-likeness, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so, much, so you must also forgive. And above all, put on, like a pair of clothes, like a wedding dress, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So the bride of Christ, it's you and me. And if you're a guy and you're uncomfortable with this, then get over yourself. <laughs> yeah, because you know, <laughs> half of this church has to read through scripture and, and see brethren all the time. And that's like where the, the sisters and where the, and it has to do with male metaphors all the time that also apply to them. So, you know, get over yourself on this one metaphor that's female. Yeah, you're okay. You're the bride of Christ. How does, how does that, it's nice. The bride of Christ has to say yes to the dress. The fitting clothes for the upcoming wedding. That is the why of growing in Christ-likeness. For God's chosen ones, for his holy and beloved bride, the clothes that are fizzing, fitting for this occasion, for compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and love and all of these things. So Paul says, put on the new self, put on these new ways of living, put on love, put on forgiveness. Why? Because you are a bride and your groom is coming for you very soon. Okay, now what's the why? Now the how. Now the, it starts with the why, but the how comes as well. So what's, the, so what's happening here? Okay, um, right in the middle of the whole passage, I'm, I'm talking through the passage here and there. He's not, he's not working in my sermon structure, so I'm, I'm, I'm making it fit. So I hope Paul forgives me. Uh, so jumping a little bit back uh, to verse 9 and 10. It says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, right? So growing in Christ's likeness, the image of its creator. But what is happening here? What does he say? Which is being renewed. It is a process. It's not like, oh, okay, old clothes gone, new clothes on, here we go, let's move on. No, it's, it, this is, this is a, this is, that's the metaphor. It, 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 is, it is a process. It takes a while. It's not a one-week journey. It's a lifelong journey of Growing in Christ-likeness. Learning to, to live more like Jesus. You are being renewed. And so Paul gives some advice in this passage as well on, on how we can actively participate in that, in that process. In other words, how do we change? And there's three bits of advice that I see in the passage I want to share with you. Jumping all the way back to first one. Focus. Focus. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. It starts with the, the, a, part, a big part of the how do we change, how do we become more Christ-like is the right focus. It's the right focus. When you are seeking to change, it's easy to get caught up in the negatives, in the, in the lack of progress, in the, in the comparison with others. Like, I, I started a little less than a year ago, I started running, I guess again, eight years later. I do sports, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then, so I'm now into running. It's my new hobby or um, focus. And um, it's nice nowadays, you got a sports watch, so you can track your, you know, uh, uh, pace in distance and your heart rate and you can check your progress so on the on the on the app i'm on strava follow me in strava uh you can <laughs> it's the only social media i'm on and <laughs> so uh and so you can kind of track how you're doing and how you're making progress and that, that becomes a great motivation like oh, i'm doing better and better 
you know what kills motivation? When you compare yourself to people that have been running every day for two decades, and you're like, they are much faster, they go much further, their heart rate's super low. Uh, and you compare yourself, and then it really kills motivation. But then, see, this is, not, have the right focus. Focus on, what, I'm just happy I got a run in, and that I did well. Good stuff, like focus on the good things, focus on the right things, focus on, focus on Christ. Focus on Christ if you wanna become more Christ-like. Second, we need to make some radical decisions. Yeah? Radical decisions. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And to write translates this even, in even more strong language. Kill off the parts of you that belong on the earth. Love it. See, because you belong to a radically different reality, the reality of the coming kingdom, that sort of stuff, it just doesn't fit. It just doesn't belong. It doesn't look good on you. You know, it doesn't look good on you. What is fitting is that we make some radically different choices than how people live in this world. Not, not out of fear, because, you know, what might God do to, the, do to us? Not out of shame. Oh, what would he think about us? Not out of guilt. Oh, we might be disqualified. But... Not because we have to reach a certain level of holiness in order to be worthy, because we're not, but we kill all those things off because they just don't belong. They just don't fit. They're, they're not part of, of where we are going to. So play them off. They're just burdens. They're just hindrances. See, discipleship is a process. You are being renewed. So it, 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 it takes time. It's, it, it's a process, and we kind of have to respect the process, but sometimes we just need to say, you know, to hell with the process. Let's kill this thing off right now. Make a radical decision. Jesus would put it in language of tear your eye out or chop your hand off. Not literally, but just to kind of get a point across. Like, this is serious business. It's not a one-week journey, but a lifetime. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't make some really radical decisions about what is in and about what is out. To stop managing a certain sin but to find a way to kill it. Lastly, manage your input and your output. Verse 16, so we're now all the way at the end of the passage that we're working through today. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts, to God, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. One of the major keys, I think, when it comes to how we change is that we're careful about what comes in so that we're sort of in control of what goes out. The saying goes, junk in, junk out. In the passage, Paul talks about two different types of sins, so sexual immorality and spoken immorality. And both are very prominent in our world. But it also gives us an antidote to the poison. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. I think we have to become more careful about the things that we fill our minds with, the things that we expose ourselves to. Let me just apply this in one simple way. I quite enjoy watching movies and series. I really do. Not ashamed. I'm on Netflix. We're on Disney. We're on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so a lot of content. Um, I've noticed over the years that what comes in, especially when it comes to like sexual immorality, I'm not watching porn and everything, but just like... It doesn't have to be explicitly that for you to be exposed to, you know, stuff that you can't, can't unsee. But when it comes to sexual immorality or foul language, if it comes in, it, it, in some way it finds a way out. So I don't know how it happens, but maybe it's forming me in some way. So I've come to realize more and more that I need to be very, very, very careful, not just with the explicitly... Not, not with the very explicit stuff that doesn't belong to the kingdom. Like, I, I don't watch horror movies, I don't watch porn or anything like that. But the other stuff where it's, where it's less explicit, more implicit, has a way to form you. It has a way to 
I don't know. You see, the, the entertainment that we consume has a way to consume us. And so I've become a lot more careful with what comes in so that I'm more in control of what goes out. You understand what I'm saying? Two bits of advice on this. One, make sure that you prioritize input from God's word over the input from entertainment. Right? Let the word of God dwell in you richly through spending time with God, reading scripture, sharing your innermost thoughts with him, journaling, like, like making an effort to seek God, to let the word of God dwell in you richly. You are working on your formation into the image of Christ. And, and it says it so beautifully in 2 Corinthians 3. It says, as we contemplate the Lord's glory, we're being transformed into the image with ever-increasing glory. Like it's, it's, we become like the one that we behold. So behold him more if you want to become more like him. It's as simple as that. Secondly, make sure to build in clear restrictions on time and type of content when it comes to what you expose yourself to. It can be what you watch, can be what you read, can be what you listen to. Building clear restrictions. I'm not saying that everything that's secular is bad. There's a bunch of great secular like, entertainment shows or whatever that, that I find beautiful, actually good for my soul. Um, but a lot of it is not. <laughs> so I'm not saying all TV is bad. Burn every book that is not the Bible. But... Can I suggest that if you want to become more Christ-like, you need to restrict the amount of time that you spend on Netflix and you need to build in certain restrictions to the type of content that you expose your mind and your heart to and ask yourself after watching the pilot of that new series, is this going to be good for my soul or not? Amen. Amen. I want to ask the worship team to come up. I'm going to close this thing in prayer and then I'm going to... Introduce you to our uh, prayer team for today so you can get some, uh, some prayer. Let's, uh, let's stand up as we, uh, as we pray. Lord Jesus, we belong to you. We are your people. Thank you for the beautiful phrase in this passage that we, our life is hidden with Christ in God. Wow. Help us to understand what that means, Lord. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. We have a new identity. We have a new self. We are now in Christ. We don't belong to that kingdom of darkness anymore, but to the kingdom of light. And therefore, when the end comes, for us it comes as a wedding, where for part of the world it will come as wrath. We belong to your future future of the new Jerusalem, the future of a restored planet Earth. Help us, Lord, to prepare for the wedding. Help us to prepare for that future. Help us to grow in Christ's likeness with this strong desire just to get ready for the wedding, to be dressed in the most beautiful, pure, white linen, that we live from our identity as holy and beloved. That we're not working to cut out sin because we feel a, sh a sense of shame or fear or guilt, but out of this motivation that we belong to you, we want to prepare ourselves for the eternal future with you. Help us, Lord, to grow. Speak clearer through your word. Help us to discern what should be in and what should be out. Help us to be radically different. Help us to, stream, to, to swim against the stream of the culture, of the world. Help us to be radically different because we belong to a radically different future. Holy Spirit, we call upon you to form the image of Christ in us. The fruit of the Spirit. Help us to grow in love and patience and joy and peace, humility and kindness, all of these things. Thank you for this church community where we get to practice on one another, patience and kindness and love. 
Thank you for the groups that are forming now that we get to journey with in the coming year. I pray that those small communities meeting weekly will also be places where we get to grow and support each other, inspire each other, challenge each other. Take us on a journey towards Christ-likeness in this year as well. Lord, there's nothing more that we want than to become more like you. So we give you our lives. We say, Jesus, you are the Savior. You are the Lord. And we invite your Lordship to reign and rule over every part of our lives. Reign over our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our work, our studies, our families, our neighborhoods, our every little bit. Jesus, we are yours. Prepare us for our wedding. Amen. 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 If anything spoke to you in the message today, I want to invite you to the prayer team. We've got a prayer team lined up on the sides there. If there's anything, like if today was just another message for you, but you've got something else that's in your heart, it's a burden, it's difficult, we'd love to serve you in our prayer team. We got a prayer card in last uh, week uh, from someone that had been to the prayer team with uh, nightmares that had been going on that just this person was seeking help for, and uh, it was really bad. And um, said on the on the card, I went for prayer. And the nightmares are gone. <laughs> the nightmares are just gone. Something that was so disturbing for such a long period of time after, after a moment of prayer. Like it's the power of God that comes when, when, when we pray for each other. So if something like that is going on in your life, it can be very different. But we'd love to pray and invite the presence and the power of God over you. He is here today. So don't miss this opportunity to be prayed for. All right. Let's worship.